Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Although there have been a number of photographs and pieces of footage that have been dug up by intrepid UFO hunters seen from the International Space Station and other sources that appear to show mysterious craft maneuvering in orbit, either observing the International Space Station or just coincidentally following a similar orbit, we have had very little confirmable evidence evidence to indicate that there has been anything actually in orbit. At least nothing that couldn't otherwise be explained by man-made satellites or more recently Starlink trains and other types of man-made objects which are becoming more and more common in low Earth orbit and elsewhere. But what if we found the byproducts of a definitely extraterrestrial piece of technology? In other words, something given off by a type of propulsion system that we do not currently use. What if it was antimatter? Well, interestingly enough, the International Space Station recently detected several particles of antimatter that simply should not have been there. And in addition to that, we have discovered vast sources of antimatter deep inside our own galaxy that could power entire interstellar civilizations, allowing them to travel between any star in the Milky Way. Sources of energy that dwarf anything we have ever discovered in the past. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. If you've been following my channel for the last year or two, you'll know that I've been doing my best to try to find any sort of photographic evidence that we might have for the existence of UFOs outside the realm of our own planet. In other words, evidence of extraterrestrial craft maneuvering around in our solar system because after all, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for these things just to be showing up in our atmosphere with no evidence of them flying about any place else. And it's been a rather interesting journey and one that I found a surprising amount of information that I didn't expect to turn up. One of the most compelling compelling pieces of photographic evidence is a 1952 plate taken from the Mount Palomar Observatory of a so-called triple transient, three highly reflective or bright objects that appeared in our skies for only about an hour or so, and by the time a new observation was taken, all three of them had vanished. These could not have been supernova or passing asteroids or anything else else. They had to be something that either appeared briefly in that location and then moved to another location or perhaps flared briefly as they were approaching our planet. Flared in a manner that is completely inconsistent with anything natural, but instead could have been rocket engines of some kind firing on three approaching craft. Rocket engines a little bit different than the types of engines that we are familiar with. Now this is probably sounding pretty familiar to a lot of you because I've already made a video about this particular discovery, but an interesting theory that was put forward by John Michael Godier suggested that it might have been antimatter photon rockets applying braking thrust as they were approaching our planet. This kind of flaring would be consistent with this type of technology, even though obviously we don't possess it, but more interestingly, almost immediately after these flares were observed in the skies above Mount Palomar, one of the most famous mass sightings of UFOs took place in the skies above Washington, D.C. Less than 24 hours Hours actually after these strange lights appeared in the skies above Mount Palomar. A strange coincidence to say the least and suggests a possibility that antimatter propulsion may be involved in alien craft visiting our planet and this is something that may have happened a number of times over the past 70 or so years since this spectacular sighting took place in 1952. Of course the difference is these these days we have numerous satellites in orbit that could easily be mistaken for something else, plus 
thousands of pieces of space debris as well, and so it would be quite easy for an approaching spacecraft to masquerade as one of these pieces of space debris and approach our planet relatively unnoticed, assuming that the craft was not terribly large. And so a young astronomer named Beatriz Vea Royale at Uppsala University, who is the team leader who made this amazing discovery on the Mount Palomar plates, claims that we should be looking for signs of extraterrestrial civilizations not in faraway stars and not from narrow band transmissions that may or may not repeat. We've received dozens of those actually, but because alien civilizations don't know that we require them to repeat to consider these transmissions as being valid, well, she suggests that we look for something else, something that might be a lot easier to find. That is to say, extraterrestrial technology that might be hanging around in low Earth orbit or in some other orbit around our planet. Technology that may have gone overlooked and now has just been lost in the morass of debris that exists around our planet. Something that wouldn't have been quite as apparent back in 1952 when there were no satellites up in space, but something that would be very hard to see these days, but not impossible if we take a very close look at everything that's actually orbiting our planet and try to identify it. And another method would be to look for byproducts of extraterrestrial propulsion systems such as antimatter. Now if you think that antimatter is either an incredibly rare thing or something out of science fiction, well I have news for you. Antimatter exists in our universe. As a matter of fact, it exists in vast quantities depending on where you look. Back on April 28, 1997, antimatter clouds and an antimatter fountain were discovered in the Milky Way. Scientists using data from an instrument on a NASA Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, also known as the CGRO, discovered two unexpected clouds of antimatter in the Milky Way galaxy, which scientists call antimatter annihilation radiation. Scientists from Northwest Western University, the Naval Research Laboratory, Washington, D.C., and other institutions use the GCRO to make the discovery, which points to the existence of a hot fountain of gas filled with antimatter electrons, also known as positrons, rising from a region that surrounds the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The nature of the furious activity producing the hot antimatter-filled fountain is unclear, but could be related to massive star formation taking place near the large black hole, or supermassive black hole as we call it these days, at the center of the galaxy. Other possibilities include winds from giant stars or black hole antimatter factories. And by the way, in the 27 years that have passed since this discovery was made, we still have no idea where all this antimatter is coming from. It appears to be coming from nowhere. The researchers used maps of gamma ray sources from CGRO, which they expected to show a large cloud of antimatter near the galactic center and along the plane of the galaxy. The maps, surprisingly, also show a second cloud of antimatter well off the galactic plane. The second cloud may be caused by the explosions of young massive stars, but again, we really have no idea even after all this time. Quote, the antimatter cloud could have been formed by multiple starbursts occurring in the central region of the galaxy, jets of material from a black hole near the galactic center, the merger of two neutron stars, or it could have been produced by an entirely different source, said James D. Kerfus, head of the Gamma and Cosmic Ray Astrophysics Branch at the Naval Research Laboratory. Now, there's a lot more information about this discovery, but the fact of the matter is, there is so much antimatter in these clouds and in this antimatter fountain that it would be enough 
to transport thousands of ships between the stars at relativistic speeds. And so, in a video released by John Michael Gaudier, who, by the way, is a YouTuber who releases lots of amazing information about these types of discoveries in a very responsible manner, he seldom jumps to the types of conclusions that I jump to, but in any event, he suggested that SETI should be focusing a great deal of effort on these enormous sources of antimatter for signs of techno-signatures, because harvesting all of this antimatter would would be incredibly useful to any advanced civilization simply because antimatter is the most efficient and the most energy intensive fuel source in the universe. Let me give you some ideas of just how powerful antimatter really is. A liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen rocket reaction produces 1.35 times 10 to the seventh power joules per kilogram. Atomic hydrogen is about 20 times that powerful. Nuclear fission produces 8.2 times 10 to the 13th power joules per kilogram. So we're looking at over a million times the power that a chemical rocket generates, but it gets even more powerful than that. Deuterium nuclear fusion produces about five times as much energy as fission does, and you can get fusion up to a total of 3.45 times 10 to the 14th power joules per kilogram. Once again, looking at almost 30 million times as much energy as is generated by a chemical rocket. Now, let's go to matter antimatter reactions. 9 times 10 to the 16th power joules per kilogram. That's nearly 300 times as much energy per kilogram as you get out of nuclear fusion. And it's simply because you're converting all the matter and antimatter into pure energy in this reaction, whereas even with nuclear fusion, the vast majority of the fuel is wasted and not converted into energy. So how do you harness this much energy for a spacecraft? Well, there's a variety of different methods. I'm not going to get into all the details here because I put out another video on the topic, but the idea is to use the photons created by the matter-antimatter reaction and reflect those photons off of a perfectly reflective parabolic mirror. And the impact of all of those photons transfers the energy of the matter-antimatter reaction directly to the rocket, and you can achieve incredible speeds with a small amount of fuel. For example, a 400 metric ton rocket, in other words, four times the mass of Starship, could be driven to a speed of 10% of the speed of light with only 53.9 metric tons worth of propellant. So just over 10% of the rocket being used to propellant, and you're getting it up to 10% of the speed of light. 170 metric tons of propellant gets you up to 50% of the speed of light. And if you use 90% of the rocket's mass as propellant, which is still a smaller percentage than chemical rockets use, you get up to a speed of 98% of the speed of light. Not only reducing travel time between the stars, but also through the effects of time dilation, only 1.65 years pass for the passengers on the ship for every 5.12 years that's passing outside the ship, reducing travel times even further and making journeys of 100 or 200 light years within the realm of possibility for a ship using this type of propulsion system. Therefore, we would expect extraterrestrial interstellar civilizations to use something like this, and we might look for the byproducts of this type of reactor, namely antimatter, where we shouldn't be finding antimatter. And interestingly enough, we found antimatter on the International Space Station several years ago, and yet it didn't seem to make a whole lot of news. About eight years ago, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, or AMS-02, aboard the ISS detected around 10 anti-helium nuclei, not positrons, not the types of antimatter particles that we detect from time to time in Earth orbit, anti-helium nuclei, which are a lot more unusual. 
These nuclei consisted of two antiprotons and either one or two antineutrons for anti-helium-3 and anti-helium-4 versions respectively. According to the standard model of particle physics, making anti-helium-4 requires that at least three or four antiprotons and antineutrons be near enough to each other and to be moving slowly enough to stick together. Based on these requirements, one anti-helium-4 would be produced for every 10,000 particles of anti-helium-3. The really interesting thing about these events is that the data seem to be consistent with about one anti-helium-4 event for every two or three anti-helium-3 events, according to the researchers who made this discovery. And that is simply impossible, at least according to our current understanding of physics. Now, the scientists who have been researching this and others have started to look to the most popular thing for mainstream science to turn to when they want to explain something that defies all natural explanation, and that is dark matter. In a new study published on June 21st in the journal Physical Review D, the team tried to explain this description using hypothetical objects called fireballs. These fireballs could result from currently unobserved phenomena such as the collision of extremely dense clumps of dark matter. Once again, we don't even know if dark matter exists, and also we don't even know what dark matter looks like, what it's made up of, what its qualities might be, but we are exploring the possibility of this inconsistency being created by clumps of dark matter smashing together. Quote, a fireball is a dense, energetic region of space containing large numbers of antiparticles. Once formed, it expands at close to the speed of light, releasing antiprotons, antineutrons, and antihelium into the surrounding environment. The antinuclei subsequently travel outward and some of them reach the Earth where they can be detected. The researchers modeled fireballs of various sizes and behavior. They found that if the fireballs were large composite objects made up of many dark matter particles, again, keep in mind, we don't even know what dark matter particles are or what their qualities might be, but hang in there with us. Then the amount of anti-helium nuclei they produced matches well with the preliminary results detected aboard the ISS. But here's the thing, instead of transforming our understanding of physics and abandoning the standard model of subatomic particles, why don't we consider a more obvious possibility? What if somebody created these anti-helium particles to use as fuel? Because keep in mind, the human species has created anti-helium particles. It takes a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous amount of energy, at least as we understand it right now, but what if another civilization had decided to manufacture these types of particles to use them as fuel because they weigh substantially more than positrons do and therefore have a lot more energy pent up inside of every particle as opposed to just using plain old positrons for antimatter fuel? And what if a few of these particles had escaped from an antimatter drive that was in operation in Earth orbit at some time? Time, and the International Space Station just happened to wander into the antimatter exhaust. And if anybody's willing to tell me that this is a far-fetched idea, if they then turn around and believe that some sort of mystical clumps of dark matter have been the actual culprit for creating these particles that shouldn't exist, well, I'd really like to smack you upside the head, at least virtually, because why is this a more likely scenario? Scenario. Why is this not equally far-fetched? As a matter of fact, substantially more far-fetched because we already know that anti-helium can be created artificially. We've done it ourselves. And we also know that anti-helium contains a tremendous amount of energy that would be very useful to an interstellar civilization. And so why are we not looking in our immediate neighborhood for techno-signatures where we never expected to find them. 
because as the evidence continues to mount, as it continues to become increasingly likely that somebody is paying us a visit, or at least has paid us a visit in the recent past, we should be looking a lot harder for any evidence to suggest that this may indeed be true, because a discovery of this magnitude, a discovery to confirm that we are not alone in the universe, in my opinion, would be far more significant than the discovery of any clump of dark matter. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and also please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. I'm about to release another Patreon exclusive video this weekend, this one about lunar space elevators and how they could revolutionize our ability to travel not only from the Earth to the Moon, but also throughout the solar system. So please check the description for various ways to support this content. Thanks again for watching, and as always, stay angry about space.